joy to see you all again. As I was saying, happy Sunday. Um, if you would open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, specifically 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse 8, we're going to be reading through verse 17 uh, today in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. So again, that's 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 8, and then going down to verse 17, we can all take a deep breath. Some of the very difficult submission passages that we've been covering these last few weeks uh, we're, we're out of the woods there, but that doesn't mean that today's section is any less challenging or any less pertinent than what we've been uh, looking at in the past. But if you would join me, I'm going to pray, um, or sorry, read this, then we'll pray, and then we'll get into today's study. So it says there in 1 Peter chapter 3, at verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his, ear, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil." Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you so much for your word and how it, um, it challenges us. It, it, it clarifies for us what is truly the good life. And Lord, may we leave today with uh, not only a greater understanding of your love for us, um, not only a greater understanding of your son Jesus, but also with a greater understanding of what the good life is and how to pursue it. So I lift up um, all these people to you, Lord. Would you uh, open our ears, open our hearts so that we can see and so that we can understand and apply the truth of Scripture today. Thank you for our time of worship, Lord. And thank you also for um, all the things that you're doing in this small but really wonderful church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, okay, so as I said, last, the last couple weeks, we've been going through some challenging portions of Scripture having to do with submission, and, and it runs just totally countercultural with what it is that our culture proclaims. Our culture is radically individualistic, and our culture is radically autonomous, and we want to assert our will over others, not have others assert their will over us. But nevertheless, in, uh, even though we're finished with that section, now we're transitioning, and if you look at verse 8, where Peter says, finally, he's, he's sort of summing up an argument, and it can't really be torn from the, the, the context in which it, we find it. In other words, all of this stuff that Peter has been talking about, it all has relevance to what I think today's topic is all about, which is, how do we live the good life? Now, philosophers used to talk about this, and I got to admit, when I was in high school and even in college, when I first started getting introduced to classical philosophy, I thought it was very, very dull and very boring, right? But the more you read some of these classic philosophers, and these are not Christians, by the way, but the more you read Socrates as recorded in Plato's writings and Aristotle and, and some of even the med medieval theologians who were probably more philosophers than theologians, one of the things that's a hallmark of their writing is that they'll always talk about the so-called good life. Now, all of us, no matter who we are and how we've been shaped or how we've been socialized or conditioned, all of us have a view or a version of the good life. And if, if you will, if you'll allow me, I think that I know a lot of people's version in this room, simply because we've been uh, socialized or conditioned to be very good Americans, right? So the classic kind of American good life, and I'm not saying that this is true of every single person in this room, but generally speaking, this might include some of your ideas of the good life. It includes, right, your own house, 
right? When, and it includes money in the bank and it includes prosperity and it includes, you know, a pension or the ability to retire or the ability to just kind of be on your own. That's what all, that, that's what a, a lot or a predominant uh, number of Americans believe is the good life, right? It's sort of that, you know, um, house with a white picket fence outside, beautiful and shining for all to see. That's sort of like the, the good life. But for a lot of the classical philosophers, they didn't think that way at all. And even the ones who later embraced Christ and, and who were, you know, writing in the maybe 800s or, you know, even in uh, the, 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 the Middle Ages, the low or even the high Middle Ages, one of the things that they said is that the good life is, is being happy. And you can only be happy if you can be fulfilled uh, with that which will never let you down. And, and one of my favorite philosophers, and I, I would encourage you, I, I recommend a lot of books, and I'm sure you guys race out to Barnes & Noble and read those books, right? <laughs> no, but um, I, I, I read this book, and, and it was really a, a, a game changer. In fact, it was, so, um, it was such a game changer for C.S. Lewis that he read it every year. It's called The Consolation of Philosophy, and it's written by a guy named Boethius. And it is... It is just about as uh, far removed from American culture that you can imagine, and yet it is so incredibly relevant. It's like reading the pages of Scripture, not inspired and, and not on par with Scripture, I'm not saying, but that, you know, the Scripture, in the New Testament at least, this, you, you, you got 2,000 years separating you from now to then. It's still relevant, though, right? And you can still glean so many insights. Well, in the same way, this book, it was written around the 800s, and it has immense relevance. It's just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful book. But one of the things that he talks about in that is that the version of the good life that was existing around that time was, hey, do you want to pursue a lot of money? Well, interestingly enough, a lot more money just equals more problems. And we know that even now, right? You get more money. And all you have to deal with now is trying to secure your goods. I mean, even the nature of insurance, and I'm not against insurance. I have insurance. Heck, I'm such a good American, I have insurance for my insurance, right? You got umbrella policies, right? You got to protect things that you own. You've got alarm systems because you own now things that you care about and you want to retain and you don't want ripped away from you. Well, what about, you know, power? You know, you want to accumulate power. Someone's version of the good life might include being in charge but then you have to worry about people usurping you, and then you have to worry about keeping it, and then you have to worry about the fickle people over which you exercise your power. Well, what about sexuality? Surely that will give you the pleasure that you so desire. But what's interesting is people who worship sex, they end up becoming lustful, right? Because again, I've talked about this, you become what you worship. If you worship money, you become greedy. If you worship power, you become a tyrant. If you worship, um, you, if you worship Sex, you become lustful. And what it does is it turns you into the kind of person that can never be satisfied from that which you desire so much. And, and, and that's the thing. So the medieval philosophers, going back to Boethius and several others, they argued that the good life was true happiness. And true happiness could only be achieved by that which would never let you down, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing, we, never can, we, we cannot forget this. You become, like you, you become what you worship. And so if you worship Jesus, well, then you become more like Jesus. And Jesus is amazing. Wouldn't you agree? You become more loving. You become more gracious. You become more full of mercy. You become more forgiving. You become conduits of God's blessing to the rest of this world. And that is the central theme that I hope to express to you through this passage. If we want to live the good life, it will not be found in that home. Now, by the way, God's common grace blessings are such that a home can be a huge blessing. There's nothing wrong with wanting to pursue that. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to pursue a good relationship. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have good kids or to have a good job or to uh, make money. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when those become your all-consuming desires, they will let you down. And you will become, like you worship, become that which you worship. And it will ultimately lead you down a path that you don't want to go. But if you worship Jesus, you'll become like what verse 8 says. Now, let's look at verse 8. Because, again, what Peter's trying to do is when he says finally in verse 8, he's summing up the arguments that he's made thus far. And the arguments that he's made thus far is that believers in Christ look different 
right? There are people that in the face of like a world that shakes their fist at power and the, 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 the people who say, I'm not going to submit, they submit. They, uh, they pay attention and with reverence and, and respect, they, they, they honor their leaders, even if they're not inherently worthy of their honor. And in the face of a, a bad, uh, maybe not a bad relationship, but in the, in the face of a challenging relationship, they honor their spouse. And in the face of a difficulty, they honor the, their, their master set over them, maybe their boss in, in some respects. They, in short, Christians look different because remember, the way that Peter originally identifies people, this is in verse 1 of chapter 1, and then in verse 11 of chapter 2, he calls people elect exiles. And these elect exiles look different because ultimately Rome was not their home. And in the same way, in the 21st century, America is not our ultimate home. That is not to say that we don't care about our country or that we don't voice our opinion, because in God's common grace, he's given us the ability to vote and to have say, and that's a wonderful thing. But ultimately, we are not Americans through and through. We are citizens of heaven. And we can unpack what that means more as this study progresses. But finally, he says, all of you, and then he lists about uh, four different virtues that I want us to pay attention to. And these following virtues can be found in verse 8. So you don't have to, but if you want to look at the screen, I'm going to go through each one. He says, finally, all of you having unity of mind. And I love this because this, again, this is an uncommon characteristic. Have you ever been on a team where people are, are fighting, whether that's a team in marriage, right, or whether that's a sports team or whether that's a management team, you know, at work. If people are fighting within the leadership or the management, you know that the, the, that mission uh, of that organization usually doesn't go forward, right? It's only when you achieve what's called unity of mind that you go forward. And I love this. It's, it, it means, right, that we're on the same team, you know, and Jesus really drove this home. At one point in his earthly ministry, Jesus has his disciples approach him, and they're like, hey, you know, these people were casting out demons in your name, you know, and, and, and they, they wanted, basically, they wanted all these wonderful works that these other people were doing that weren't directly following Jesus. They wanted them to stop, and they, 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 they wanted Jesus to say, hey, you know, cease and desist, right? This is, this is um, my territory. This is what I do. This is my MO. And Jesus says, don't tell them to stop forever, you know, for whoever is not, you know, uh, against me is with me. And, and Jesus was, was so much bigger than just kind of rivalries or, or people who just wanted, you know, tur to play turf wars. And, and I see this a lot within the body of Christ, especially. There can be such antagonism against uh, certain fraction, factions and certain groups within, you know, that, that, that there's no unity of mind. But what Paul, or excuse me, what Peter is calling for is a unity of mind here that basically means that you're on the same team. And even if you do, if, even if you do disagree, at the end of the day, you know that you want the best for each other. So Sarah and I have learned this from, from a therapist that we, that we went to go see. And whenever we do premarital counseling, we always try to drive this home. We always say this, hey, you, you know, Sarah and I are doing the, the premarital to, to the potential bride and the potential groom, right? You guys need to think the best of each other. And not only that, even when you disagree, you need to be uh, um, charitable enough to be able to say, I think you still have my best interests at heart, even if you disagree, because fundamentally, you're on the same team. Now, what if the body of Christ could think that, right? Like, hey, we might disagree about little subtle things. We might disagree about ministry philosophy, but at the end of the day, we still want to see Christ's name glorified and elevated. And, and, and those things that unite us are much greater than those things that divide us. And this is a this is a pretty big condemnation, I think, for a lot of Americans who have split, split off and made, you know, denomination after denomination after movement after movement after movement. There are some things worth splitting over. I will hold the ground when it comes to Jesus being God, and I will hold the ground uh, over, you know, certain if issues of orthodoxy. But when it comes to, to certain other issues that are maybe secondary or even tertiary, I don't know that we need to divide over those things. And that's one of the reasons why I think the Evangelical Free Church of America, it's not the perfect church, it's not the perfect movement, but the reason why we're in this denomination, they would say a movement, the reason why we're in this movement 
is because, you know, within the, the, the walls of this church, there can be people who disagree, but they disagree charitably, right? And when they disagree, they disagree with the love of Christ, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I tease about this, but I, I truly mean, you know, I've, I've teased about, you know, in the past, whenever I get in a disagreement with, you know, a, a, a fellow pastor, it's like, hey, I'm going my way, you're, or I'm, I'm going God's way, you're going your way, you know, kind of thing. Well, that doesn't always work, right? Because we need to have the unity of mind. And I think, especially within this church, we experience a great deal of unity of mind. But Peter goes on. In verse 8, he says, sympathy. Now, when, uh, when we translate this word here, it, it really means to suffer with someone. And I, I actually think a better translation of this word uh, for our English ears would be empathy, right? Now, now, let me tell you why it's not translated empathy, because the Greek word behind it is actually sympathy, right? Like sin, uh, uh, S-Y-N, is, is actually a, a Greek uh, prefix, and, and pathos or pathos has to do with suffering. Well, anyways, to suffer with someone, the reason why I would say it's better conveyed empathy is, is the same reason why, uh, if you've heard 1 Timothy 3.16, you know, all scripture is inspired by God. Well, interestingly enough, the word inspired actually is the Greek word expired, right? It means all, all scripture is breathed out by God, right? Because God doesn't breathe in scripture like it's in him. He breathes out scripture. But the reason why it's translated inspired is because it wouldn't make any sense to us in English, right? Because expiration in English has a very specific meaning. Well, it has two meanings, really. To expire can actually mean death, it's a very euphemistic way of saying, oh, yeah, uh, that person expired. It's kind of a weird way of saying death, right? But it also is like, oh, those bananas are expired. You know what I mean? Like, those, that, that's gross. So you wouldn't say all scriptures expired, even though that's essentially what it's saying in scripture. But inspiration for us English speakers makes, this, makes more sense. Well, in the same way, I would say that the ESV nailed it. It does say, um, finally, all of you have unity of mind and sympathy, but the, the, the thought behind it is this. You're suffering with someone. You're not just saying, aw, sad for you. You're actually getting down, crawling in the hole with them, right? When someone is down on their knees or down on the ground because they've just had a, a, a terrible experience and they've just you know, really kind of gotten lambasted by life, we're down there on the ground with them. We're crying with them. We're, we're suffering with them. And the body of Christ really needs to do a better job of that because our first thought can often be, well, let me cheer you up. But I, I just want to remind you that if you go back to the Old Testament, there's an entire book of the Bible that, if I'm honest, I don't always like to read except when I'm actually suffering. And that book is Lamentations. Lamentations gives you not only permission to express your grief and your suffering, it gives you words to express it. And so within the body of Christ, we're really good at singing good songs, and we should, right? We sing joyful songs because the Lord gives us joy even in our mourning. However, before that, it's okay to admit that you're suffering, and it's okay to lament and to tell God, hey, how long until this gets turned into the joy? My mourning gets turned into joy. How long will you allow this suffering, for my suffering, to, to, to last? And in the midst, so, so we all know, okay, we all know that in the book of Revelation, at the very end, 21 and 22, God is going to restore all things. He's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. But until then, we're still living in the midst of Genesis 3, right? Where sin and death they reign, they prevail. Now, we do have, though, an asterisk right in the middle. That is that Jesus came, he died, and he, was, and he rose again. And he's the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 says, of those who rise again. But guess what? I haven't risen from the dead yet. Have you? There's still death all around me. Isn't there death all around you? And they're suffering because of that. And it's not just death. It's also, it's also suffering in terms of I can be living and have cancer. I can be living and experience someone betraying me. I can be living and experience intense brokenness. So in the midst, between Genesis 3 and Genesis, excuse me, Revelation 21 and 22, where God will restore all things and wipe every tear from our eyes and make all things new, we need to be like Jesus. 
who, when his friend died, didn't say, don't worry, Mary, don't worry, Martha, I'm going to resurrect him, don't you worry. He cried with them, right? Jesus wept. Shortest verse, and yet one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture, because it showed that Jesus had sympathy in, in terms of he suffered with his friends. Let's move on. He also says this in verse 8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, and then brotherly love. Now, I'm sure you're familiar, but in Greek, there are several words to express the word love. Scripture uses three in particular. Eros is one that connotes usually a sexual kind of love. It's where we get the word erotic. Another one, though, is agape, and that typically connotes like a, a, a higher love. It doesn't always have to, by the way. Um, if you go back and you read some of the original documents in Greek, agape does not always mean a higher love. But usually in Scripture, that's what it is. But then there's the word phileo. And we get that word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But phileo in, indicates there it's this brotherly love. It's this mutual affection. And, you know, this is something that's very, very overlooked also in the church. And part of the reason is because if it, within the church we've elevated marriage to, to, to such an extent that we think that marriage is the end-all, be-all for all the, what ails people. I love marriage. I think it's, it's a sacred institution. I want to honor it. I want to uh, have people um, experience wonderful marriages. At the same time, we have neglected a very central focus, and that is brotherly love. And, when, and here, I'm not just talking to the brothers. In other words, I'm not, I'm not just um, speaking only to males. But you can experience um, brotherly and sisterly affection, and it's a really wonderful thing because there are no sexual overtones to that. There are no, hey, will you do this for me in, the, in that kind of love. All there is is there's a mutual love and appreciation where, you know what, I would drop anything to help some of my friends. I would drop, you know, what, what, whatever I have to do, I will make sure to do because I love that person. And the church really hasn't elevated that that much. Now, again, I'm not talking about this church because I feel an overwhelming sense of love. And those of you who have been through a difficult time within this church know that you're going to get like 90 texts, phone calls, and at least three letters from Tommy Jean. Because when you're going through a hard time, she loves you, we all love you, right? That's just what we do in this church. We, we, we shower each other with love. But we can always do better. And in fact, the Apostle Paul, I love this, he says, outdo each other in works of love. Like, outdo each other. And almost like you need to one-up each other. Hey, I see your, uh, your, your act of service here, and I raise you this. How wonderful would it be, how countercultural would it be for the church to do that with no strings attached, with no sense of, well, if you do this, then I'll do this for you, but just because you love that person. And this isn't saying you can't have boundaries. This isn't saying that you, you, know, you have to you know, uh, drop everything or, or leave your honeymoon to go help your, your friend. But it's saying instead that you, know, this is, this is, you, are, you, you are prioritizing other people over yourself, which is the gist of submission anyways. Well, let's move on. He says, a tender heart. You know, th to have a tender heart, and, and, and we, we often think here of, um, like, val I, at least I think of Valentine's Day, you know, like hearts everywhere and stuff like that. But to have a tender heart means that you act upon that which you, you, uh, you see, right? So if you see someone going through a difficult time, your heart is moved. This would be synonymous, maybe not synonymous, but it would, it would at least augment the uh, earlier comment that Peter had to have sympathy, right? You're suffering with, and you're suffering with someone because you have a tender heart. You see where they're suffering, and maybe you haven't experienced it yourself. I haven't experienced cancer. I haven't experienced some of the awful things that many of you within this room have experienced, but yet I can see on your face how it's affecting you. And I don't need to have words to fix it. I just need to have a tender heart to remind you that someone loves you in the midst of it. Right? That's what, it, that's what it's all about. And finally, we need to have a humble mind. See, none of these virtues are possible if Christians are not aware of their position before God. Because you can't possess any of these things in and of yourself. In and of yourself, you know what I would have? Let, let's read through this list in an individualistic way. Absent Christ, this is what I would probably have. Finally, all of you have individualistic, you know, uh, a state of mind. 
don't don't have don't have sympathy. You know, have a have a you know a, a very narrow view of focus, right? Don't have brotherly love. Have a this for that relationship. Oh, I'll do this for you if you meet me halfway, right? A tender heart? No, don't have a tender heart. That'll just get you into trouble. Instead, have a have a um, a tough uh, a stiff upper lip. You know, our British friends might say. You know, uh, but don't don't let things move you. And then don't have a humble mind. Be prideful about where you're at because after all, you've achieved where you're at. But a humble mind acknowledges that it's only Christ who can give you these virtues. It's only Christ who can effect or bring about these things within you. And it all hinges on that. So he goes on and he reads, he says, don't repay for evil, and this is in verse nine, don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Now, on the face of it, if I read this verse, my selfish heart wants to say this, Okay, so if I don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, if I bless other people, then God's going to bless me. Kind of like what I do with Luke or Jane, our kids, when they're, you know, when we're, you know, doing something and I say, hey, if you're good, I'll take you to the, you know, I'll take you to Target and get you a toy. Is that what God's saying to us here? You know, he's like, hey, if you're good, I'll give you that cosmic blessing you've desired. I don't think that that's what God is doing at all, or excuse me, what Peter is saying here at all. I think instead what this is conveying is this. A good, the good life turns out to be a life of blessing, which entails blessing others. The older I've gotten, the more I've realized how much more fun it is to give than to get. Amen. I mean, wow, you guys are alive today. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I truly mean this, though. Um, it, it's so, it's so um, funny because, I mean, if eight-year-old Mikey before the Christmas tree would have said, no, it's better to get, you know, right? I mean, that's what I wanted. But now it's way more fun to see my kids wowed and awed. It's so much more fun to, to go out and to get Sarah something that she would never get normally herself or, you know, to, to, to bless someone. And, and because God has had us in the position where we've had to rely on him for so long. And now he's blessed us, not to the point where now we're just, you know, like Scrooge McDuck, you know, uh, like, like it, swimming in gold coins or anything like that. But we're in a slightly better position because of his grace. Now we're able to bless others and there's nothing quite like it. There's something that's so wonderful. So the game, so to speak, is actually in the blessing. So, so, so the good life is found when you can go out and bless others. That's one of the aspects of the good life. Of course, the good life is found in Christ, but one of the facets that we often forget is that it is so good. It is such a great feeling to, to be a conduit of God's blessing, where God's blessing is showering us from heaven, and we are in turn are showering those around us. So I just got asked, uh, I was very humbled, um, uh, one of my my mentors from young, uh, when I was very young, all the way to uh, even being in college. He recently passed away. He was my football coach in, in high school um, through kind of a, just a series of uh, kind of strange circumstances. But he was able to reach me at a time when my, I just didn't want to listen to, to my father. And, and he was able to be like a father-like figure. He was uh, an incredible man of God and, and, and just such a, uh, such a light to so many people. And uh, his family asked me to present the gospel message at his funeral, which is coming up in April. By the way, I'd love your prayers for that because it's going to be a packed house. This guy influenced countless young people through his ministry, and it was sometimes in a vocational local church setting. He served in a church sometimes, but oftentimes it was in public schools where he was able to interact with kids who normally would never have stepped foot in a church, but who nevertheless would have listened to their football coach. Well, I'm able to give the, the gospel message. And one of the things that I was reflecting on as I was kind of preparing my heart for that was Psalm 23, right? Psalm 23 talks about this. The, it, it's such a wonderful way to end. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I used to always think, and pardon me, you've probably heard me say this, but I used to always think that that meant that goodness and mercy will be in front of me, like I will be running to it that God's going to just hook me up with a great life. And then I lived life, and I was like, man, sometimes this life is hard. Yeah. Wait a minute, this, this verse is not true. What I think it means is that those, whenever you're in the presence of someone who is truly um, shaped by God, 
that when you're in the presence of someone like that, there's goodness and mercy. And when you're with Jesus, oh, there's goodness and mercy. But get this, when you're with the people who follow Jesus, oh, there's goodness and mercy. Now, we're all cold lately. I don't know how we're cold in Southern California, but I want you to think back to the heat of summer, heck, even the heat of like October and November. You know what it's like when you're outside and you're walking from your car and your car doesn't have great AC or whatever and you're just hot and you walk into a place like Target and there's that like wonderful just, there's the AC. You know what I'm talking about? And you walk and you're like, oh, this feels great. That's the way it should feel when you interact with someone who loves Jesus because the goodness and the mercy it follows them. It trails them. It le- it, they left it behind. It's in their wake. Think about that. And there are people in this room that I know that every time I'm with them, I walk away with a smile. Even if it's just a simple interaction, I walk away with a smile because it was like, hey, I just came in contact with the Lord because goodness and mercy was right there. That's what this guy's life was. And that's what our life should be like if we're shaped by God. This is what verse, verse 9 is saying. It's not that, hey, if you do good, if you do good, little Mikey, I'll buy you a toy in Target. You know, it's not that. It's instead, if you don't repay evil for evil, and if you don't revile when you're reviled, if you bless instead, guess what? You were called to do this, and you will obtain a blessing. One final thought on verse 9. When it talks about for this or for to this you've been called, Calling language in scripture is huge. And, and I have done a disservice. I, I have boldface lied to you as a pastor and used this, this language. Forgive me. But I, I'm teasing kind of. But I, I, I want to try to make this point. I've talked about I, I feel called to the pastorate or I feel called to join the military or I feel called to minister at Covina Evangelical Free Church. You might feel led to do that. But technically speaking, whenever the Bible, especially the New Testament, employs calling language, it's to all Christians. So unless every Christian in the world was called to Covina Evangelical Free Church, I sh- I, I, I'm using that word wrong. Does that make sense? So, so for this, you have been called. It's not just calling ministers or elders to works of good service or to live a life of blessing. It's calling all y'all, Right? It's calling everyone. When the Bible uses calling language, it's, it's, um, it's big. It's epic. It's mobilizing all of God's people. And that's why it's important for us to just pause and say, huh, I have been called to a life of blessing. Am I leaving in my wake goodness and mercy? Man, I'll, t- I'll tell you, sometimes I leave in my wake a lot less than goodness and mercy, right? I leave, I leave right? I, I leave, yeah, exactly. I leave all kinds of stuff behind me sometimes. Not always pleasant. And God is saying gently, live a life of blessing. Live a life of blessing. Let's go on very quickly. He says, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, his lip from seeking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, he's quoting here, Peter is, because he's a very excellent student of the Old Testament. He's quoting Psalm 34. And by the way, just as a side note, because I always want to try to give you little, little tools you could put in your tool bag, so to speak, whenever it is that you read Scripture on your own. Whenever you see in like quotations, right, whenever you see indented, you should kind of like, oh, it's probably quoting the Old Testament. Maybe sometimes it's quoting like philosophers, like when um, Paul is preaching in the Areopagus, he quotes Stoic philosophers, even some Epicurean philosophers. But that's a rare occasion. Usually when it's indented like that, he's quoting from the Old Testament. And it's sort of like, you guys know when you're looking on the internet, and you see a text that's hypertext. You know what that is? Like where it's blue and you can click on it? Well, whenever the Old Testament is quoted like that, you should assume the entire context, not just the scriptures quoted, but the entire context is in view. And in view, in Psalm 34, and we don't have time to go there, is this. This is an invitation to all of God's people to come and worship in the temple. 
And it's an invitation for God's people to live and experience a life of blessing. So again, it's not saying like, hey, if you do right, then you'll be blessed. It's saying this is the kind of rich life to which you've been called, a life of worship, a life of blessing, a posture of goodness and mercy trailing after you, leaving it in your wake. Because whoever desires to love life and see uh, good days, boy, that sounds like the good life to me, right? Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. I mean, this sounds like a lofty, high calling. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so again, the good life turns out to be a life of blessing where you are not leaving destruction in your wake, like I can be so often prone to do, but instead leaving goodness and mercy in your wake. In the time that we have remaining, let's look at the, the, the rest of these scriptures. Now, um, before we get to that, let me... Okay, so verse 13, it says, Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? In other words, he, he's kind of hearkening back to, remember the persecution and, you know, honor the emperor and submit and all that stuff. He's saying, well, hey, who's there to harm you if you're zealous to do what's good? But even if you should sucker, suffer, not sucker, excuse me, suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And then he says this, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, I want to ask you this question. How do we understand this verse? Because almost every time I hear it, it's quoted from my evidentialist apologetics friends People who love like William Lane Craig and J.P. Moreland. By the way, I love me some, you know, J.P. Moreland and all those guys. But if, you've, if you know what I'm talking about, apologetics is um, a defense of the faith. It has nothing to do with apologizing because you're wrong. It has everything to do with saying, no, actually, I'm right and I'm not sorry for it. So the word apologia in Greek actually means defense or to provide a defense. Now, a lot of times they will quote this verse as saying, I'm going to defend Christianity through the ontological proof of the existence of God or something like that. Well, I don't think that in view, in context, that that's what Peter means here. Now, we should be able to defend our faith. But in context, and the reason why I think this is important enough to bring up right now, in context, what I think he's saying is, Live such a questionable life that you're ready to give an answer for why you live it. Now, I I remember listening to a a podcast that was not Christian about a a man who had adopted a young girl who was just the love of his life, the apple of his eye. And this sweet young girl grew up to be a very strong woman who was active in her community and was doing all kinds of things. And she was viciously raped and killed by a meth addict. And this meth addict, I mean, it was, it was an open and shut case. He admitted he went to prison. But one of the things that set the story apart was that the dad reached out to him and through his tears, through his brokenness, said, I forgive you. I forgive you. And it started a correspondence between this meth addict who is now clean and sober because he was in prison and he wanted to turn over a new leaf and he wanted, it started a correspondence such that it changed both of their lives. Let me just tell you, that is questionable. Because what would I want to do in that case? Oh, I'd want to kill him. I'd want to make him pay. I'd want to make him suffer. You know what I would want to do? Go back to verse 9. I would want to repay evil for evil. I would want to revile with that which I've been reviled. But that's a guy who doesn't even have the love of God or the hope of God who showed extraordinary forgiveness. That's a questionable life. Christians are called to live a questionable life so that when we live, people are going, what is, you shouldn't be forgiving. You have no business doing that. What are you doing? Say, you know what? You know what's in me? Jesus. And it's different. That's what should make it very different. Thank you. You, Everyone's alive today. I'm so glad. Goodness gracious. And Sarah said this was going to be a terrible sermon too, so I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. So I just want to bring up that she's the sweetest. Yeah. Sorry. I I just didn't want to like keep on crying, so I did like deflect it with something because I'm so uh, uh, insecure. So 
Um, true or false, right? So this is a question that I want to pose to you based off of why I think verse 15 doesn't have to do primarily with apologetics. You could use it for that. Of course, I, when, I, when I talk to some of my friends who have objections to uh, Christianity, I'll, I'll, t- I'll, I'll refer to this, right? I want to be ready with an answer. But, you know, there's a, a, a thought that St. Francis of Assisi, right, a, a, a saint a long time ago, he is reputed to have said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, I loved this quote when I was in college because I was too ashamed to, to proclaim, right? I was, I was a little bit sheepish, so I was like, you know, I'm just following St. Francis, you know. I, I don't want to have to say anything. But now I think, well, first of all, it's questionable whether he actually even said this. But second of all, man, this is garbage. Of course you need to use words. Now, first and foremost, I think we need to live lives worthy of this. Like, I think we need to live questionable lives, which is what Peter's talking about in the first place. Because elect exiles are so weird, they submit, they love, they don't repay evil for evil, they forgive, they, they, they have grace and mercy traveling in their wake. They live such weird lives that you've got to question it. Man, what makes you different? So when you're posed that question, please don't say, I don't know. You should say and you should use words. And he follows it off with this. I would say it's a necessity to use words, of course. I'm sure all you would agree. But the rest of verse 15 says this. Yet do it, that is your answer to the question, do it with gentleness and respect. And so so often we we just sort of, you know, race to uh, how do I prove this and how do I, you know, but just do it with gentleness and respect. That humble mind that verse 8 was talking about. Well, I think the take-home truths, brothers and sisters, is that the good life can only be found in Jesus Christ. Because, let's read it, verse 16 uh, through 17. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. See, it actually seems consistent from, in the reading of, of this passage, it seems consistent that those who are experiencing the good life in Christ will experience suffering. That's not my definition of the good life all the time, right? My, the good life for me, man, I, I, I worship, I have an idol of security. I have an idol of, um, you know, just wanting to be um, uh, financially independent and all, you know, all these things that are, are wacky. Jesus says, hey, y- you who... who you have all these kind of hang-ups and idols. I want you in a church like Covina that's going to upset your world, right? That's going to change you and, and how you rely on me. And the good life is not mutually exclusive with suffering. In fact, suffering can be good for us. But the good life can only be found in Jesus. The good life can only be found in him so that we know that all the other common grace, common grace blessings, uh, family, a, a good job, um, a nest egg, you know, uh, children and, and grandchildren, you know, a, a legacy, all these things can really only find their fulfillment in, if, if we put Christ as, cent, as the center. And we never want to forget that the good life entails blessing. And it entails not just the blessings from God for us, where it stops there, but the blessings of God that flow through us to all the people around us. So right now, I can't think of a better way to end than to respond in praise. And uh, right now, uh, Dave's going to come up, and he's going to lead us in uh, some songs. And so could we just, you know, just as a church, you don't have to do anything different. There's no posture that's going to make you more accepted by God. But can we just, as a church, pour out our praise on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's given all these blessings to us to begin with? Friends, I have this benediction for you from the book of Hebrews in chapter 13 at verse 20. And maybe this is the benediction that you were talking about earlier, Paula. But if it's not, I'll give it another try this next week. (laughs) Would you receive this benediction maybe in a posture of reception? Now may the God of peace, who is brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So go in grace and peace, brothers and sisters. God bless you, and have a great Sunday.